Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today I'm here with Mark, G, and Walid, and we are a group of uh, international, since we got Mark in here, acquisition entrepreneurs. We got a project we're going to talk about today. I, I do want to disclose I'm an active shareholder in this project, but um, they've currently already have an acquisition. They've got some work done uh, already and we're moving forward. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation we have today and uh, to learn what you guys have already done, where we're going and share that with our audience. So uh, let's do a round of kind of who everybody is and I'll do it in the order of my screen. So Mark Moodley, you're uh, your first one. Tell us who you are, where you're kind of located and how did you get into this space of um, mergers and acquisitions. Sure. Thanks, Ron, for that. So, yeah, my name is Mark. I'm living in Australia. I've been here for nearly 10 years now. Trying not to get the accent, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, Basically, been in small businesses for most of my life, buying and selling one particular business. Worked for a long time for a European car manufacturer. And then when I came to Australia, I did a couple of courses some of these well-known um, buy companies, experts that we know of, and got heavily involved then into mergers and acquisitions. And that's what I'm doing now, just looking for companies to buy, um, acquire, invest, partner with, with a view to improving and building groups, basically. Awesome, awesome. And Gia, uh, same thing. Where are you located and kind of how did you get into the space? Um, I am in the Metro Detroit area just close to Ann Arbor. And I have been involved in M&A for several years now. It it was part of pivoting out uh, during COVID. I bought my first company in um, 07. And um, so since getting into M&A or acquisitions, we've worked on several, some bigger groups like like roll-ups and as well as making some acquisitions along the way. I have a background in marketing and publishing and advertising. And I've also done, since since COVID, I've done a deep internship with Jay Abraham and taken several courses in the area. Awesome, awesome. And Waleed? My, uh, my name is Waleed Kostandi. I'm in Orlando, Florida. I've been in the... Uh, my first startup was in 1995. A friend of mine and I, we started an ISP, and when we sold it about five and a half years later, he did handle most of the sale part. I handled most of the growth and engineering part, but it was a lot of, that was a good experience. And then I did it again with uh, my brother. We started a company, and I exited that. And then um, I got heavily into real estate. And I got back into wanting to own my own business again. So instead of starting up, I went into M and A into to buy businesses. So I'm really hands on, very operational oriented, and uh, and I really like to focus on helping people, helping employees, you know, make the most of their careers. And that's very rewarding for me. And since I'm a shareholder in this, I probably ought to introduce myself to the people who aren't regular listeners. I'm Ronald Skelton. Uh, I'm sitting in Guerneville, California right now, originally from uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the middle of nowhere. I say Tulsa because that's what everybody would know in Oklahoma, but uh, have a background in everything from tech management, technologies, got burned out on that, got a master's degree in marketing, got in the marketing world, uh, real estate investment firm bought our marketing agency. I ended up in real estate for a while, 
And then when I got out of that, I ended up in mergers and acquisitions and I've been doing that and hosting this show for two and a half plus years, now three years now. So uh, quite a bit of experience. I've interviewed some of the top people in the space, learned a lot and uh, really enjoy growing companies through acquisition and, and helping companies, uh, you know, help, helping people buy companies as opposed to starting them from scratch. So now that everybody's been introduced, let's talk about the, the project. Let's start off with uh, the industry. So what industry are we currently focused on in general? So Mark selected this industry. So Mark is the brains behind it. So he should really delve into it. I mean, we love the industry too, but he gets all the credit from the selection side. Okay, we'll have this question be from Mark. Mark, tell us about the industry that we're currently in. Okay, so it's essentially at the base, it's the flat pack industry. I did a lot of research and I found the flat pack industry to be what I thought quite simple. Cut out some board, get a few screws, put it all together, and you've got a product which you can sell to the final customer or you can sell to a builder or an installer. And I realized that flat pack is pretty much in everybody's homes. That was my first stage. And then I realized, <laughs> never too old to learn, that the majority of kitchens are made with a base using flat pack furniture. And then that opened up a whole new avenue for me. And again, pretty much every home has got a kitchen. And I thought, well, this is an excellent industry. And it's morphed itself into cabinetry and kitchen manufacturing. I think flat pack is a, a term I haven't heard before. So I, I get it. I get the concept. Basically, it's any product. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind when you said it is Ikea, right? Everything comes in a flat box right. and you got to put it together yourself, right? So, and I never thought about the cabinetry business. Even been working for you guys for a long time and with you guys for a long time. Never thought about the cabinetry business being like Ikea or flat pack, but, uh, Having been in the real estate space, I've had cabinets come in that way, <laughs> right? My, I didn't install them. I, I didn't get my hands on that stuff. I had, I had teams that would do that. But, you know, they usually would curse me if they came in that way because it's extra work. They're used to them coming in boxes, like, you know, they're mm -hmm. actually prefabricated. Yeah. All they do is, you know, take the protective covers off of them and slap them on the wall, right? So uh, I think, cool. um, I think the, the IKEA reference is, is a good one in order mm -hmm. to situate the debate. The difference where we are is that we go into the renovation and the customization of people's kitchens. Ikea, you'll go there, you'll buy a set kitchen, you'll bring it back. They are doing more and more research into providing customization, but we take it a whole lot more further insofar as it's not only the kitchens that we look at, it's obviously the bench tops, it's the appliances, it's the situation of geography, the windows, the doors, and we customize up to a millimeter to where it needs to go. So there are no gaps, no exits, no dust vacuums and things like this. The customization is is really what we're selling at the end of the day. Awesome. And uh, you've in Australia, we've completed a, a purchase already, right? So you've you've been through the process. Let's, let's talk about what led up to that. The industry was identified, right? And then I assume you started beaching out and talking to people in the industry. What was the process like? Was this a off-market deal, a broker deal? So went through a lot of brokers to begin with, which helped enormously in building up knowledge and identifying the key, key criteria that you need to be looking at. The first deal we did go through with a broker, which was an horrendous experience. I never yeah. realized how much a broker works, defends, fights tooth and nail for his client, not really thinking about the buyer. And I thought that was a bit of a backward step from this particular broker. Nevertheless, it helped us a lot because we were able to ask a lot more questions during our due diligence process, which was important as this was our first acquisition. So we may have done too much due diligence, but then afterwards, we all realized with G and Wally that we didn't do enough due diligence. It was a smallest right. affair. So the risk was limited by that factor. And I think the most important thing really is that the six months since we bought the, the company has been a fantastic learning curve for us all. It's interesting. You, I've had quite a few get, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, taking a small, a small company like that 
You know, mm-hmm. we all thought of buying the 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollar businesses. This one was less than a million dollars, but it was manageable. And if something goes a little bit <laughs> off course, it's relatively straightforward to bring it back, which was kind of like we want to, yeah, it's a safe, it's a safe situation. For the employees, they come into an environment where we are a safe pair of hands. There's the three of us with you know, a lot of collective knowledge. This was an established business, making some decent dollars. So for us, it was a great learning curve. Yeah, I think it's a smart move to take you know, the first dive into the industry, right? To take on something that you know isn't going to sink you if you don't get it right. And uh, as far as the due diligence goes, I, I've had a few guests that had a, a put it br- brilliant that said due diligence is always done. Sometimes you do it correctly before you acquire it, and sometimes you do it after you stroke the check. <laughs> but you always find without uh, find out everything within the first twelve to eighteen months, right? So due diligence always sure. gets done. You're just hoping to do the majority of it in the most scary things before any any money changes hands and, and responsibility changes hands. So we take our lessons learned and apply those to the to the next one. What was the process like as far as, you know, the working with brokers and finding these deals? Did you run into a lot of brokers that had deals they just weren't represented right? Or, did you, or is it like, is, did this, we're, we're talking about Australia here, and I know here in the United States, you know, a great broker, if I take a handful of brokers, a great one's like, I probably got one of my fingers would be a great broker and the other nine are, yeah, <laughs> right? Uh, it's hit or miss here. And I hate to say that because I've had a lot of great brokers on the show, but it is uh, a lot of brokers, you know, shouldn't be in the business. Is it the same way there? Did you run into a lot of people that were like horrible at representing what they were trying to sell to you guys? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, definitely. I have a couple of friends who are brokers who don't operate in this space. And they told me, honestly, I, I can't help you. It's not my space, which I appreciate. Mm-hmm. They could go off and find things just for me, but it's not, they are professionals. What I found with the broker that we used, that he wasn't so much a broker as more of a really bad salesman. Right from the moment where we got the information memorandum. Is that what you guys say? Information memorandum? Yeah. Yeah. CIM. Yeah. Right from the moment we got the information memorandum, the way things were presented. I mean, we all understand you've got to present things as best you can. So you know, there was a little bit of give and take, but there it was just take, 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 take. And so we didn't like that. And then the broker did get in the way a lot of time, a lot of times of when we wanted to communicate directly with the senior employees. And that, I think we both, we all agree that that's something you, know, you need to be able to talk to you, the senior employees. They need to be in on the fact that the company's up for sale, that there will be a new owner. And then the, the new owner needs to get some nitty gritty need to get some inside details. And I really despised this broker because of the barrier that he put up, put up for us. What's happened since then? You've, you, you guys reached out, I uh, imagine to, to multiple, you said, you had, you know, conversations. What was the cycle like from the day, uh, the, from the day you talked to him the first time to uh, the day you guys closed on it? Are we talking weeks, months? How long did it take? So it actually, all in all, due diligence from the, from the moment we... So I actually went up and saw the company in July, and then we actually closed in January the following year. And that was largely largely due to the broker getting in, in the way. And But once we actually signed signed the contract, which I think was October, Gia, Wallid? October. Yeah, he was around then. Yeah. yeah. So once we actually signed a contract, um, you know, we did go over the top in the due diligence and well, what we thought was going over the top and asking lots and lots of questions. And then the seller went away to Europe for a whole month. And then here in Australia, January is our summer holiday. So nothing much happened in the first few days of January, which which basically meant we lost kind of six weeks in the in the process. And we finally signed on the 21st of January. So in real terms, I guess we probably worked two months from the moment we kind of signed a contract to the moment we actually actually closed. Were there any surprises? I know Wally's really great at, great at financials and you guys were digging through all this stuff. Compared to what was presented at the first of the conversations and what the broker told you versus what the owner told you, and then what the due diligence truly showed, was there any... 
wait a minute years. <laughs> right, like the thing which surprised us most of all, and which we found out afterwards, afterwards, was the state of the machines. Now, my fault. I went up there with an expert. We looked at the machines, and we said, "Okay, it's there. It's there. It's there." But for some reason, I never asked them to actually operate the machine, which was. You know, afterwards, I thought, "How could I? How could I do that?" You know, it's like if you're going to buy a car, and you don't ask the person to start the motor up. So that was a big, big, big mistake on on my part, which meant that when we actually bought the company, one of the first things that the top management came to see us was, "We need to change a CNC machine. We need to change a forklift. We need to change the panel saw." And when we looked at it, they were right. You know, we didn't accurately, accurately estimate the value and the usefulness of the of the machines and the assets there so that was a big surprise and of course nobody told us that that like the forklift didn't have brakes for example the uh it, it, and i would imagine that's information had you got to build rapport with the at least the top level management you probably could have heard some of that like you know uh what needs to be replaced what needs to be fixed when you when you told me you, you took an you know, expert in there and you didn't turn on the machines it, it you know that reminded me of like taking a, you know, a mechanic with you to see a car and he checks it out but he doesn't have the owner start the engine right you looked it over a lot of things can look great at the surface right and, and you you start the car and you start hearing the clanking underneath the hood um you know that's an eye opener right and the other thing ron is that is it in i wasn't experienced in buying a manufacturing business mm-hmm. so i put this down as part of the learning curve as well and in the next acquisitions and previous ones that we've seen, you know, we have taken more time to look at the machines and study them, check the serial numbers, go on to various internet sites to check values and things like this. So, again, lucky we did a smaller, smaller acquisition as opposed to a fifty million dollar acquisition. And you walk in on a Monday morning and you realize your twenty million dollar CNC machine is worth five dollars fifty. <laughs> it's crap metal. Yeah, right. it's crap metal. So, Gia, when you took a look at this, when you're the marketing person, when you took a look at this one, did you see things that you can improve? And uh, and that's one of the things we always look is what can we what we what can we do to make this better? Was there any anything that you looked at and said, you know what, we can really make a big difference in this company fairly quick? Yes, there was um, there's quite a bit. We had to take our time with that first because mm-hmm. there was settling all of the other issues of the transition. But yeah, there really wasn't much marketing going on. And, uh, you know, so we're in the midst of working on a website update and figuring out what kind of social media presence we want to have and ramping that up. And so it, it was around the board. There's really no advertising going on. Community events, the company is deeply in the community. And I think that's a good approach for us because of the size and the location and the type of population <clears throat> that the sparsely they're spread out because it's more of a country area. So using the different local aspects, uh, local advertising opportunities, event sponsorships, community building type of um, organizations and activities is where we're, we've been focused so far. And now we're ready to gear up in the realm of social and website and Google page and things of that nature. So yeah, there, because when none of those things were properly utilized or fully to their, you know, full extent, they, so we have a lot of space that we can gain in that arena. And then on the operations side, I know that Waleed likes to, um, he thinks very logically and stuff. Were there systems and processes? Was the factory laid out? Like, did you guys look at the efficiency of, or capacity of like the fat, you know, the manufacturing capabilities? Are they before before the purchase? And what it, did you learn anything after the purchase that you know, were at a certain capacity and grow so much before they had to do something different? Well, in terms of operations, um, we had a good handle on what the capacity was, and we realized that. In the present situation, the way things are now, by the time we bought it, they're at 80% capacity or so. So, you know, we had a strategy going in and that's, you know, we, did, we discussed it several times. And I think probably Mark had come up with it first. That is to outsource a lot of the production because he knows the market. So uh, instead of us 
or our floor staff doing all the major cutting and you know uh, carpentry work and so forth, then you can source that out and have it done. It comes back to you ready cut. So then your work is minor on the cutting job and more assembly. So all that speeds up the production and increases our capacity. It reduces your margins a tiny bit, but actually not significantly because the, the big machines that do the cutting are more efficient. So you may pay a higher price, but you're not paying expensive employees to, to do the work. And then in terms of operation efficiency, you know, I have to make a side note here that when we took over, it took us a little bit to understand that the employees were scared as hell. They were like scared. <laughs> Even the, yeah. uh, you know, one of the bosses there. And, and, and we finally, it took us a few weeks and Mark was so cajoling and polite and gentle with them that they warmed up and then they started taking action and discussing with us. So they removed the poor producing machine, made more space. They wanted to do this. They started getting more ambitious and uh, motivated to do these changes. So our production capacity is, you know, and sales now is higher than it's probably ever been there. And we're not full capacity anymore. We hired two more people. And uh, so operationally, it's, it's going pretty well. And, uh, and it wasn't, this, this broker was an ass <clears throat> and the lawyer was a bigger <laughs> ass, but uh, it, was, it wasn't a good purchase. It was probably the most reasonably priced broker listed company I've seen in a long time. And when we did the numbers and we made an offer price, it was accepted. And after due diligence and financial checks, you know, we asked for an adjustment on the price and they yelled and screamed and they lowered the price and we had a deal. <laughs> and then towards the end, when the financing, you know, was just a little short, you know, we, the seller even agreed to do a seller note for about five or 10% of the purchase price. So. It, it really worked out in the end and it's cash flowing. That's why we like this industry. It's a cash flowing, you know, modern growth industry that puts money in your pocket. So the, um, you, you guys, now you're in there, you're operating things, you're finding opportunities to make it more efficient, to, to have it, to have it grow organically. What's happened in that space as other, uh, other people in the industry and other people in the market that know you acquired, have they reached out to you and said, Hey, we're interested in selling too? Yeah, it was, it was really very exciting. The first couple of months afterwards, because once the reps started to realize that things had happened, we did get an influx of people coming and saying, Hey, what are you doing? So it wasn't necessarily sellers, but there was accountants, there was a couple of business brokers. But it was through our suppliers who and the reps who kind of have their ear to the ground where we had some some really good conversations. So the fact that we'd done one in that industry suddenly took us up quite a bit in in terms of um, reputation, I guess, and, and level. So some of the deals they brought to us were too small. One man band operations with an apprentice and that kind of thing and a 35 year old machine, which we weren't interested in. But what has really happened is that our language now is when we are talking to potential sellers and, and prospects, you know, I may only have six months experience compared to some people who've got 30 years experience, but that whole exchange, Ron, has really changed now. So we just don't talk about the fact that, you know, are they ready to exit? Are they looking to do this, that, and the other? We can also actually go and look at the machines. We can talk about the operations. I could talk about the team with G and Wallied and, and how we, we, there's a package there and bring it all back to the operational side. And that's, that's been really amazing, acquiring the experience and the vocabulary to be able to talk to, to, to sellers. We do have a couple of deals at the moment which we're working our way through. And I do feel it has helped enormously. Any one of us, when we talk to these sellers, the fact that we can not really an equal conversation in terms of experience, but at least we find connection points. And that's been so, so good in building rapport with these uh, potential potential sellers. Yeah, I, I've learned that a lot of these industries and businesses are kind of like small towns. They all know each other. So I, I was curious as to once, once the word gets out that you've acquired something in this industry and you're still looking, right? You're, you're willing to acquire more. 
that your the phone would start ringing. So, what is the buy criteria? And we're going to go jump over to the United States pretty quickly here too. So we're we're still kind of talking about Australia in your market. What is the what they call buy box or the criteria of, the, of businesses you're looking uh, that would fit that portfolio that hold co in Australia? For me, Ron, it comes down to one thing, and there needs to be a general manager there with experience. That in itself dictates that it's not a $1 million a year company. If there's a general manager there, that suggests there's a team, there's expertise, there's a capacity to back up, there are some machinery, there's existence, there's history. It's, a, it's It becomes a decent sized company. So that is kind of like become my main point. Is there a general manager? It's not just the owner who's doing everything. But obviously, if the owner leaves, you know, he's your best salesman, your best technician, your best, you know, relation with the client. If he leaves and you have nothing, then that there's a big, big gap. And how do you fill that gap? And I feel that the only way, there are other ways, but for me, the most important way that is that there is a general manager there who can carry on the business. And I know here in the United States, we've just recently in the last, you know, in the last months, really dialed up what we're reaching out to and who we're talking to. But this puts this one to Waleed. What is the criteria for a U.S.-based company to participate in the U.S. holding company? Do you own a well-run and profitable business in the kitchen and bathroom remodeling industry, a cabinet or countertop manufacturer, or an installation service? Have you been in business for more than 10 years and have revenues of at least $1 million or more per year? Have you ever wondered who could carry on the legacy of the business you've poured your heart into? Who would cherish your customers, your employees, and the community as much as you do? For many business owners like yourself, the business isn't just a business, it's a part of who you are. It's the relationships with employees, many of whom have become like family. It's the customers and community ties that have been nurtured over decades. The thought of retirement brings with it questions of legacy, care for your employees, and the future of the relationships you've built. We are a small group of entrepreneurial investors with a history of success across various industries. But more than that, we are individuals who understand and respect the deep connections you've built. Our approach to business mirrors your own, focusing on relationships, community, and legacy. We're not just looking to invest. We're looking to nurture and grow the very essence of what you've created. Our process begins with a conversation, understanding not just the numbers, but the stories behind them, your employees, your customers, and your community. We meet you where you're most comfortable, whether that's over the phone, Zoom, or at the right time, in person at your business, ensuring a transition that honors your legacy. We commit to preserving what you've built, maintaining the brand identity, supporting the same charities, and nurturing the team and community relationships you've established. If you're considering the next chapter of your life and want to ensure your business's legacy is in safe hands, let's start a conversation. Together, we can explore a future that honors your life's work and propels it into the future. If this message sounds right, feels good, or just piques your interest, get in touch by sending a direct message to Ron Skelton, the host of the show at linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Ron Skelton. No space between my first and last name. Thanks. Again, that's linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash R-O-N-S-K-E-L-T-O-N. Thank you. Now back to our show. So um, like our criteria is that we don't have to manage it too much hands-on. Like We don't want to be the operator. And... So the sale process can take a little while. So there's a transition period to someone that can run the business promoting from within. There's always people interested. So that's number one. We we don't we own we want to own these businesses as an independent of us. Uh, number two, they have to be cash flowing, or we have to do some sort of financial engineering to get them to cash flow positively, like high revenue but poor payment structure, right? So. They have to cash flow. And then and the third criteria really is that there has to be capacity for growth. Even if it's, uh, you know, 70%, like, like, like the one we bought in Australia, 
even though it's 30% headroom for growth, if there's more opportunity to growth in other ways, and we can make it work great if the leased location has 20%, 50% of the space isn't used efficiently, and we can use that space for more machines, that's growth. So there has to be that opportunity there. And the negative criteria is that, you know, we don't want to buy something with very old equipment. Some of these owners have very old equipment that are just, just don't work. You can't upload the designs to them for them to cut automatically and that kind of stuff. So those are the main criteria for us. That's what we're looking for. But as someone who is older and retiring and wants to sell their business, but there isn't a lot of value in their business, we can still talk to them and work something out because there's a lot of value in their book of business. You know, right. that uh, their, their customer history, their name, and so forth. So we could probably work something out there and at least give them something to walk away with their head held high. And then, um, Gia, what is it for you? Uh, what is the long term goal for us as far as getting these brands and these different companies out in front of people and modernizing the approach? Because I've looked through them, you've looked through them, I've got a marketing background, you've got a marketing background. Quite a few of these companies we've looked at, they're stuck in the being nice to 2000s, but being honest, probably in the 90s <laughs> with their websites. Yeah, and I was thinking 80s. 80s maybe but, yeah. um no i mean there are there are the odd companies that have kept up hmm. but um a lot of companies are their paper they're yep. still using paper or um doing things manually or not doing anything at all sometimes we've found places where a, a nephew or a child has put together some of the social media so the long-term goal is to come up to speed, up to date in the in our digital realm, make sure that there's a strong online presence, there's a strong method for pulling people in, getting them, gaining attention, building reputation, building that online presence, having people, have, establishing a strong funnel to begin with. And that can be paper-based. It doesn't have to be all digital, but organic growth, paid growth, Things that we have some say in, making sure that the market that the company had originally identified as their own is accurate. And if they're actually have been targeting that, that market, or have they been, have they been too narrow or too general? So things like that, looking for where we can optimize everything about the presence of the company, even if it's, if it's the look, the color scheme, the whole, without taking away from what they've already established. So we want to blend what they have and the depth and the reputation in the community and deepen that and have people come in who new customers or repeat customers who can strongly advocate out in the community for us. So that's, that's a long-term goal, but to get people advocating for us, uh, customers to advocate is, um, that's kind of like the, the golden ring or the, the brass ring. I, I prefer golden rings myself, but. So. A lot of these business owners, they're out there, they run the business for 10, 20, even 30 years, some of them longer because it's a second or third generation business. When they go to sell, right. there's a few things they're looking for, right? The safe pair of hands. They want to know their employees are going to be taken care of, that maybe they really love the brand they created and the reputation they have, and uh, they identify with it. They tie a piece of their own identity to that brand and to the safety of those employees. How are we going to make sure that we're the safe pair of hands and how are we going to make sure that those employees stay employed and can thrive in their communities? For me, I think all of us are on a similar plane in this mm -hmm. regard. Um, the, the employees are the lifeblood of the company and most companies have a footprint in their community. They impact more than just the owner and the employees. So there are stakeholders, there are suppliers, there's customers past and present and future and the dependence on having solid businesses, local businesses, it's, uh, it's very important. So we want to nurture our employees. We want to build good relationships with them. We want them to feel comfortable and, and know that there's a leadership team that they can count on, that they have good direction. They work in a safe environment, you know, that all, all of the, the benefits that can be afforded are, are there for them to take advantage of. And I know that everybody else feels the same way or similar. Yeah, I can imagine making sure the environment is both 
uh, clean and safe here. You know, when you say safe environment, I, all I can see is table saws and band saws, right? I grew up in a woodwork. Right, you know, my my dad has a few, or before he passed, he was missing a couple fingers, <laughs> right? Uh-huh. I don't know any woodworkers who did it the old school way that's been doing it for more than 20 years that don't have at least a partial nub somewhere. So, uh, yeah, so that's that's not the yeah. normal vision I have of a, a woodworking shop. Now, these manufacturers, they have automated tools and stuff like that, a lot more safety procedures in than somebody pushing a you know a piece of wood through a table saw. Nowadays, we're more, more worried about hearing and the vision protection and, and inhalation, you know, as I mean, because the machines are so, so much better nowadays. On the point of the employees, I mean, you know, we, in the, in the purchase contract, I mean, you have the option to decide which employee you want to, you want to keep and, and leave. And in Australia, the contract, I guess their standard broker contract stipulates that you have to specify which ones you're going to keep before closing. So wow. we were all upset that one employee was leaving and then it turns out that nobody wanted him and he was very disruptive. So like it worked out like <laughs> the bad employees will weed themselves out. So, you know, my, my concern with employees is, is everyone happy with their position? Are they doing their work well enough that they are uh, deserving a promotion or a raise they didn't get? So like, you know, we give everybody small raises across the board. And we promise the top people to give them a performance review and a raise and they performed well and we gave them a raise. So, and then the jitters just went away. You know, that's, that's what I'll question with employees because I don't want to do the work. I just want to tell you, I want you to do the work. So like, I want you to be happy. Like if you're happy, I'm not happy. So that, that's our whole approach of it, right? When did you guys tell the employees that, hey, we bought this? Tuesday morning. So a Tuesday morning before work or like during the middle of the day? It was actually about half past nine, ten o'clock in the morning. Okay. But so people were just, just getting totally busy. <laughs> it was it was it would have happened. It wasn't a perfect Wednesday according to Ron. It was also almost perfect. Yeah. <laughs> pretty close. You did pretty good. Yeah. I just I only know just this because of you know, talking to people you know, multiple times who I, I've talked to a guy who bought a company in uh, in Africa. And within, I think he said 21 days, every single engineer, every, every, every he had 20 some odd employees, a hundred percent of them quit in the first three weeks because oh. he, he came in and started making, it's a software company. He's coming in and started making changes and they just all panicked and left. So he ended up with some software, but no, no employees and no code. So there's, there's definitely a wrong way to do it. I don't know that there's a perfect way to do anything in this space, right? It's just, I, my curiosity is. Uh, Mark, you were probably present when it happened, when they told the employees it was being sold. What was the look in the room, right? When you looked around and you were watching everybody's faces and stuff, did you did you see any, like, you know, did people kind of expect it? Do you kind of see it like, okay, yeah, that makes sense? Or were people totally shocked? Nothing wrong. It was deadpan. <laughs> I felt like a really bad stand-up comedian. You know? Oh, no. <laughs> I did. It was atrocious. I tried to make a couple of nice comments. And mm-hmm. just looking around the room thinking, oops, that didn't get down too well. <laughs> but um, <laughs> then what I did immediately afterwards was the legislation is such you have to make an offer, as Wally um, mm-hmm. mentioned previously. So I had all my envelopes with me and I was able to individually go to each person and say, well, you know, hey, Brandon, hey, John, hey, you know, this is your offer. Please come back to me in the next couple of days. Let me know what you think so we can talk about it. But um, yeah, really bad public, I'll tell you. <laughs> so that's it. You had to go to and say, hey, we'd like to keep you and like do some type of offer letter to the, like an employee, because uh, you did an asset purchase, I imagine then, right? right. So you mm-hmm. you purchased the assets and then you had to hire all these people into your new hold co or your, your new uh, special purpose vehicle, as a lot of people call it, SPC. So that's interesting. I never even thought about like having to go and say, hey, here's your offer letter. There's a stipulation in Australian law I, mm-hmm. I add that you have to present that two days before closing. So, so you had to require Yeah, so it's required to do that two days before closing. Were there any, uh, one guy, you said one guy left, right? Right. But on the point of the jitters, it's important to note something that we didn't realize before is that we weren't making changes. We were talking with the two top managers there, mm-hmm. the sales manager and the production manager, 
about our ideas about certain changes. And they came to the next general meeting and they're like, please stop making changes. Like, we didn't do any changes. Like, you guys want to do this. And Mark said this. And and we're like, but we're just discussing them with you. So you can't even talk about changes. You have to keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Like, and, and then introduce anything like, what do you think if I move this mouse a little over to this one inch to the right? Do you think they'd be okay with that? Okay, we'll do that. And the next, I mean, not that small, but so it. if you don't want to keep people leave, you have to introduce the changes very slowly and not even talk about them. Just introduce yeah. them like. I think um, I think you, that's in our experience, listening has been really good because effectively we did go in and say we'd like to improve the business and make more money and et cetera, et cetera. And that sort of got the resistance that Wally mentioned. But then when it came down to listening to them, there was like three or four purchases we had to do. So like the mm -hmm. forklift was one, a panel saw was another. So we went along with this and we, we, you know, we did what they wanted pretty much. It's true. We're a bit, we lacked experience. So we were a little bit depending on what they wanted, but it's been great. They've, they have said ex exactly what you said, you know, the management have listened to us. We've made these two or three purchases. We have improved their working conditions. It's great. And even at the moment now we're, we're about to embark on uh, the introduction of a central IT system, which will cover everything from, from start to finish. And it's been really welcomed because they've seen that we've listened to them before. And now we're, they know we're genuine, that we're trying to build the business. So it's been, that change was, um, was really good because we listened. Yeah, I think it built some level of trust. There was some, a, a level of trust that wasn't there that over time by, by listening and our own observations too, because we want to expand. We had things we wanted to do. And it was kind of like what you're talking about, gathering the information with Mark's meeting with everybody and finding out what do you think we need? And it, it made a big difference in the uh, receptivity and the, and the not joy, but you know, the, the appreciation of their work and what they wanted to do with it. You know, there was kind of a, you could feel it, you could sense it. So it worked well. So were there any surprises in the employees or the employer, the, uh, the, like one of the things I learned over the years and talking to all these business owners, owning many businesses myself, I'm even guilty of it is sometimes you keep somebody around just because they've always been around and they know how to do something, even if they're not the best employer, the best at doing what they're doing. Was there anybody that, you know, having had all those discussions with everybody, you realize that somebody was just really miserable at either doing their job or miserable being there. And they needed to find another position either with in the company or outside of it. Not really. We have, we have one, one chap who did a four year apprenticeship with us. Mm -hmm. He's in his second year afterwards now. So he's been with us for six years. Previous owners included, obviously he's 22 and he's desperate for dollars. It's always that underlying conversation with him. He wants dollars. He's very financially driven so that's the only kind of um it's not even an issue really but you know that's we have to manage that everybody else it was um you know are you moving the factory you know nope okay thanks mate you're talking about resistance <laughs> to change uh there's certain things that you got to be real cautious with and uh there's a the, the whole book who've moved my cheese came up to mind because you move the factory i don't care if it's five miles on the road you change somebody's traffic you know pattern they have to go through or their routine in the morning you just wreck their entire world <laughs> right so people i remember you know many a years ago i haven't had a w2 job in probably 20 years but many years ago when i had the w2 you, you probably had the same days uh, the same experience when you were out there working there were days where you got up got ready had your morning routine and showed up at work and you're like, how did I even get here? I don't remember driving to work or the same way. Like you, you leave on a Saturday morning to go somewhere and you accidentally drive to work. You're so into a cycle of routine that you like you do that. So moving the facility is a very sometimes required if you have to like scale or you don't have enough space at your facility or something, but it's something that I bet would take deep, deep thought. Mm -hmm. So, and I think as, as the U S requirements, as we're looking at companies in the U S the last thing we want to do is remove any of these 
you know, facilities unless it's just strategic that they have to. Right? It's the only logical thing we can do is to move them to a bigger, better, or different location. Correct. What's your thought on that, Wally? Well, that's why we look at uh, capacity, you know, like yep. it has to have the capacity because it's not easy to move. It's yep. not like you're moving desks. It's not yep. software development yep. and design engineering work. It's, it's equipment. It's, it's a factory. And you have to lay the electrical. You have to remove them, disassemble them, reassemble them. You can't do that without the help of the manufacturer's rep. So you, you're talking about a, like several days loss of production plus days lost before and after to plan the move. Yeah. Mm. So that's why our criteria is like, you know, there has to be some capacity availability, right? Some of capacity could be replacing equipment that's old. Replace it to the machine twice as fast, right? That's an investment. So are these machines, uh, and I'm going to display my ignorance in the machines a little bit, are they single phase or triple phase, Mark? Triple phase. So if you need to move, you have to move to an area that's zone, in the United States would be considered zoning, right. zoning, zone industrial, and you can that's get true, triple yeah. phase electricity and into the building because that's that's not a common thing in all warehousing space and everything. So uh, yeah, I can see where moving this stuff is. The um, to p- find locations for that, it cuts down to the industrial parks into the custom build. It's almost easier if you have a facility, you find a facility that has some land on it or whatever, and either the owner or either you buy the land with the building, with the facility, or the owner is a lot going to allow you to expand, right? And even the cost of, uh, I mean, electricians installed in three phase, it's not, mm-hmm. it's not cheap. <laughs> no. And they have to bring in their cherry pickers and pull things from the roof and just moving. We moved our CNC machine from one side of the factory to the other. <laughs> we'll be doing that every week. <laughs> <laughs> I bet not. The, um, is the equipment similar or the same? Like do you have the same manufacturers there in Australia as we will here in the United States or is it totally different? Actually? Yes. I've seen a lot of similarity. Yeah. Okay. We've seen a lot of similarity. Yeah. There's an Italian uh, manufacturer that, they supply all over the world. They're very popular with cabinet makers. So uh, we've, we've had a lot of conversations about what you've already acquired, the Australian market, a little bit on what we're doing here in the United States. Let's focus for a few minutes here. What is our vision? What are we looking to accomplish? And the overall, you know, especially here in the United States, what markets are we focused on, all that type of stuff? I'll let Waleed kind of go over that with us. So in the States, we're, our first step was uh, Mark was helping us with the research to identify how the market is structured. We did some initial research. We found that the market is a bit fragmented. There are a lot of older people that may want to start retiring. And so in the U.S., it's, a, it's one of those typical indices where there's, there's like two or three, one or two huge players. And there are a wide market of middle level players and many, many, many small players. So that kind of fragmentation is good because a middle sized player is we want to accumulate companies and move up into that, into that area, that sphere, that layer, the middle market. What we're focusing on geographically, we decided is that it's, it is very much on the ground. It is local. People like talking to local people. So we're focusing on the area around where I am, Central Florida, and the area where Gia is around Detroit, Detroit Metro. And we're contacting these owners to find out if they're ready to exit. And, you know, uh, we, we really, we really, really, really want to take care of the employees and keep them situated and give the owner a legacy and as well as a payout. So that, that is our overall strategy. And is it just these cabinet making companies or is it all the kitchen and bath space or what's the kind of criteria? Well, the only time, the only times that I've had problems in business is when, and with investments is when I try to grow too fast. And when I didn't look at the downside risk, when I failed to do those things, it just didn't work out. So expanding too fast is, is not good. So I want us to stay focused on the core business of cabinetry, accumulate a few companies, and then start going laterally into the supporting services. And so like Mark and G are very creative at coming up with things that support the businesses. And so those are all things that we're going to bring into the mix a few, you know, two years down the road. But it's important that we collect the first two, three companies first 
and then enhance and support that, right? We need a base to operate from. And then with the downside risk, we have to analyze them and make sure like, what is the downside? What, you know, what can go wrong with these companies? So, uh, but we like, we like everything home and remodeling, kitchen, bath, appliances, uh, things like services, like door painting, you know, like <laughs> we came across that. I was like, it's a service. Like a lot of these people, nobody does specifically door painting that have done in a special way. So definitely want to expand it to those. And we were also thinking about going into a retail market that proposed this to online retail sales. So what if we do online design that cuts a sales process in half? So that's you know, bringing money that way, spare parts. It's, it's, it's very, very specific there. We've looked at acquiring paint companies. Mm-hmm. The, the, the process over here, they call it two-pack. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, from what I've understood, it's aligned to a certain number of different materials and levels that they put onto the, onto the covered doors. And I said, well, like, what's the deal? Just paint it. And they said, well, <laughs> compare the cabinet doors to normal doors and the wear and tear. And it's really, really true. You know, normal doors get a lot of dings and hits and it looks tired and what have you. Whereas the cabinet doors, they got a whole lot more protection. It's a lot harder to damage a cabinet door because of the, the, the paint process. So let's talk about kind of what's the, what's the opportunity for people to work with us? Are we, would we be open to talk to anybody that wanted to participate in this, bring either skills and or money or bring us leads in the cabinetry space? You know, what's our, how open are we to having other people work with us? Well, I'm, so, I mean, if someone wants to um, work with us because they know someone uh, who wants to sell the business, then definitely we can, you know, find a way to compensate them. But of course, there are there's guidelines and that vary from state to state, and that's the best part of it. At least every state has its own rules. <laughs> so um, I don't expect a referral fee, but uh, you know, if we can find a way to compensate you, that's you know above the line, and we will do that. We just started exploring the potential of bringing on investment partners, so we're kind of uh, going through that evaluation process. And I, I and our thoughts are just to. And do it by debt equity type acquisitions, uh, debt financing. I mean, but you know, if, if 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 it grows enough, I think you know we, we might take on some investment partners. Very open right. to lots of conversations, Rob. You know, I mean, this is a big space. There's lots of things to do there. We've realised in our six months, there's lots of things we don't know, lots of avenues with the, that we that we can explore. So yeah, definitely open to to, to conversations, and it's a well-known phrase, but like the win-win kind of situation. We, we grow together and that kind of thing. And I think this, this is an absolutely amazing opportunity over there. You have so many people. There are so many opportunities. Over here, we've got like 12 million houses. I don't know. I mean, in California, you've got like 30 million people. There's more people in California, I think, than in uh, the whole of Australia. So, yeah, I mean, you know, so the opportunity is enormous there. For the moment, effectively, we're just looking at Florida and 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 the Michigan area. But I know, in, I mean, was it twenty five million people in Florida already? Wallied and probably five hundred thousand just in Detroit. It's just, it's, I think Florida is twenty two million. It's, it's just nuts. Yeah. With numbers. How much is that? Ten million in 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 Michigan. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's probably like five million in my area. Mm, there you go. So um, so yeah, open to lots of conversations. It's uh, yeah. Let's 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 build this thing and, and and move it forward all together. Awesome. Well, I've asked a bunch of questions and I've covered both the Australian market and the United States market. What am I missing here? What what kind of you know what's out there that you want to make sure people know before we go? I guess first of all is how do they reach us? What's the best way to contact us? Well, uh, the the joint venture project that uh, Mark and us are doing. I mean, the our project is called Are You Ready to Exit? So you can go to Are You Ready to Exit dot com. And that tells us, tells prospective sellers what we're doing and how our approach is and all the contact information there and how to get all of us. Um, it's just, it's very brief, brief not a ton of information, just enough to give an idea. And if you like what you see, great. 
And one thing we didn't we didn't talk about, and I don't know, maybe we don't have time for it, is like, you know, how our team works together. Like, how does someone in Florida and Michigan and, and uh, Brisbane, Brisbane, Australia, how how do you work together? And the time zone differences, and like, I, I may be operations and spreadsheet centric, but I don't do I don't I don't I'm not the only one doing that. You know, Mark and Gia comb through my work and point point out all my errors. Like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Gia barely does anything only marketing. She does so much else. Like, you know, she and I draft the legals together. She goes on a fine tooth comb and documents come back from her. You know, more red than black. And then Mark gets it. And so we collaborate a lot <laughs> and we you know discuss and debate a lot. And uh, so. I think it's important, you know, that our people recognize our team, we're not siloed at all. So we overlap a lot. And then I think that's what makes us work. Even though we missed some things in due diligence, that was because from disinformation we received. But otherwise, we'll uncover that the information is there. Yeah, we spend a lot of time on Zoom too, right? So we're, we're and a lot of yeah. people are like, okay, you guys bought a business uh, a year and a half ago. You've been working with the other for two years. All of us have been on other projects together, so we're all we all have previous history. We've all, some of us uh, own other uh, business, you know, ventures with each other. Some of us have been on different business business uh, ventures with each other, and uh, probably what three three and a half years now we've been in communication, yeah. working on projects together in some form or another. Yeah, and people so watching this. Might... I'm sorry, Jen, you go. Sorry, I'm just saying we've developed a level of trust and also a cadence of how we. How we meet, when we, how we work. Sometimes we'll have working sessions. Zoom has become our friend, and has really, you know, technology has really facilitated everything that we're doing. And um, we work individually, and we work as a team sometimes in within a meeting. So I was gonna say, like, you know, Ron interviewing us, but Ron isn't just a podcaster; he's one of our partners. So, like, Ron's strength is like he can collect information for us about, you know, how to contact the businesses. Ron is very good at talking to people like I may choke up, you know, and then Ron will be like, hey, yeah, I did this and that. Are you ex military? So forth, boom, boom. And then, like, suddenly, like, can you be my kid's godfather? Like, so. <laughs> so <laughs> Ron. And Ron has talked to so many MA people that, like, he's now a walking book of knowledge. Just like he, he from, I was almost taking notes during the meeting when Ron said, like, here's a way that the serial entrepreneur, what they did is to get ideas across and employee buying on changes. Like, like, that's great. Like, so Ron introduces ideas that he's learned to our team and we adopt them. Yeah, we do. And that's one of the reasons I kicked off the show is to, to learn from other people's experiences, right? There are three ways to learn. You can go to college, you can read a book or, or four ways. You can read a book or you can learn from other people's mistakes or you can go out and make them on your own. My goal is to never do the last one. I don't want to go out and lose money, lose time, or lose energy discovering I I messed up. When I can yeah. you know, look at books, look at education programs, hire mentors, and talk to experts and learn from their lessons. So I, I want to bring all that to the table, and I want to, to make sure that – and part of that is the database. Uh, we all, Because of you guys' connections, because of my connections for the show, if we have a problem, we usually know who to call. Right. If something pops up, like, yeah. you know, I, I know who we need to call. Let's call this guy and get him in here and let's have a conversation of which way we go. So imagine having a company where you have 250 advisors in your Rolodex that are willing to answer a couple of questions before they want you to stroke a check. Right. So that's why that's the disposal of the company. All right. We've covered quite a bit of topics. I think, I think we've I think we've covered this really well. Before we go, though. If, if you guys are out there, you want to work with us, you want to, we have to watch for the SEC stuff. If you want to invest with us, there's that might be later on. If you want to bring a deal to us, anything like that, and you have questions still to figure out if that works, my contact information is on every bit of the show notes. I'm part of this team. You can reach out to me directly. I'd love to, to have conversations with the listeners anyway. So reach out to me on LinkedIn. Reach out to me on, uh, via email. It's, uh, it's in the show notes. It's on my LinkedIn profile. And I'll answer your questions and we'll work together the best we can. That said, I think uh, I think we covered this pretty well. You want to call that a show, guys? Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, sounds Thanks, good. Ron. Well, thank you for being here. Thanks, Ron. And we'll call that a show. I want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. 
Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and m and to decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace, we have partnered with, has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and, self, and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT enabled business, you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the IT exchangenet.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now